All right, let's get started. It's my goal this morning to do nothing less than remind you of the meaning of life. Now, let me be really clear about this. It is not my intention, like most modest UU ministers, to give you only one possible personal valid meaning of life. No, I plan on giving you the capital T, kit and caboodle, all said and done for all eternity meaning of life. Do you doubt I can do this in less than 30 minutes? And are you wondering, from my curious sermon title and all this nonsense about hippos this morning, what in God's name hungry hippos have to do with joy and happiness? Well, sit back and listen carefully. Listen carefully. First, to the hungry hippopotamuses. In his book, Free Thinking Mystics with Hands, my colleague of California, Tom Owen Toll, recounts an ancient Egyptian myth, which says that after death, every person, whoever, every person is, quote, confronted by the god Osiris with a quiz that has to be answered honestly by each soul. After 42 routine questions concerning how the deceased has lived, Osiris asks a crucial two-part question. First, did you find joy in life? And second, did you bring joy to others in life? Now, according to Tom Owen Toll, the, per, the petitioners cannot lie to Osiris, and much is at stake. For if they answer these two questions affirmatively, yes, I found joy, yes, I gave joy, they are returned to a measure of continued existence. But if they can't answer those two questions in the affirmative, they are taken away forthwith and eaten by hippopotamuses. <laughs> now, let's pause right here and do a little Animal Kingdom fact check, building on Kelly's fun uh, time for all ages. First, African hippopotamuses, the internet tells me, while they can be very aggressive toward one another and other species, are almost entirely vegetarian. They mostly live in the water and eat water plants and do not at least technically eat people. But it is true that if you violate their territorial boundaries or get too close, they will charge you. And the internet says they can run about almost 20 miles an hour and they may try to crush you in their jaws to death. The fact is that more than 500 people are killed every year in Africa by hippopotamuses. Luckily, this African gamekeeper was fit, and he outran that hippo, actually got away from that charging hippo. But the point here is that hippos, otherwise known as river horses, in case you were ever tempted, are not to be messed with. They are very dangerous animals stay away. So technically, this ancient Egyptian myth has it all wrong. Hippos don't really eat people. They just try to kill us. But that bit of nuanced animal science is really uh, beside the point. I love the point, the spiritual point of the myth. As Tom Owen Toll says in his book, reflecting on this ancient story about Osiris and the questions, this old Egyptian myth teaches a valuable lesson about joy and the purpose of life. Note that the emphasis on one's ultimate fate is not, Owen Toll says, on what we produce or our possessions, not even on our creative talents or our good works. The purpose of our earthly journey, according to ancient Egyptian religion, is simply this. Did you find joy for yourself? Did you take pleasure? and satisfaction in life? And did you bring joy to others? Were you kind and generous to those around you during your earthly sojourn? Now, I've been a UU minister for almost 50 years. And in that time, I've heard many articulations about what the true meaning of life is. And I have to tell you that I think this simple old Egyptian answer is as close to perfect as I have ever heard. Upon reflection, I do in fact believe 
that a, a, that a deceptively, as, as deceptively simple as it first sounds, we are in fact put on this earth to find joy for ourselves, not be miserable, and in the same breath, as much as you are able to bring joy to others, to give generously to others that they may be happy and fulfilled. All right, so let's start with the first half of this spiritual equation, finding joy for yourself. This, I think, begs the foundational question, what exactly is joy, and how do we know if we have it in our lives? You know, joy, I think, is not some sort of obvious, straightforward commodity or state of being that we can define once and for all with absolute precision. Here's what my dictionary thinks. Dictionary definition of joy, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness, pleasurable feelings or emotions caused by well-being, gladness, and great delight. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? And I think I know what joy feels like in my own life. I had a lot of joy and heartfelt pleasure last weekend when I was with my extended family in Wisconsin, sharing meals, biking together through the rolling countryside, playing with my nephew's twin boys, and staying up late, laughing our way mostly through decades of old family memories. I was blessed with a lot of real personal joy last week. And in addition to recognizing my own joy when I'm in it, I think I can recognize it in the lives of others when they are in a state of joy. But surely joy is a mystery that manifests itself in a thousand ways and differently from individual to individual. I mean, there are quiet joys and boisterous ones. There are physical joys, spiritual ones, intellectual joys. There are momentary fleeting joys, and there are sustained joys that can last for hours, even days. Joy is a mysterious, personal, and often fleeting thing. But most often, most of us, like Potter Stewart, the Supreme Court Justice, who said, pornography, I know it when I see it. Uh, joy, I know it when I feel it. But let's get back to the Egyptians and those hungry hippos. At first, this dualistic suggestion that the purpose of life is to find joy and bring it to others um, may seem a little contradictory and paradoxical to hold those two thoughts at the same time. It reminds me of the famous quotation by American essayist E.B. White, who once said, and now I paraphrase him, every morning I rise with the twin desires to savor the world and save it. This makes it hard to plan the day. <laughs> but in fact, I think that taking and giving joy, savoring and saving the world, are two sides of the same valuable spiritual coin. That only in conjunction with one another do they in fact together give our lives their meaning and joy. As I thought about it, I realized that our ability as persons to take joy and find joy for, our, for ourselves is inextricably and spiritually and emotionally bound up with our ability to give and create joy for others. And here's how I think the equation works. I made this wonderful flow chart in my office the other day. The flow chart of joy, receiving joy for yourself and giving joy to others it feeds on itself as a cyclical system. Knowing how to open yourself to joy is directly connected to knowing how to give it to others. If you don't, and the reverse is true, if you don't know how to give joy to yourself, you will never know how to create it or share it with others. So what at first might seem like purely selfish pursuits, taking joy, savoring the world, privately enjoying your own life privately, enjoying meals and family, are in fact the very things which empower and energize us to selflessly care for and nurture life and persons around us. This is the great truth which Jesus of Nazareth understood deep to his heart 
when he famously affirmed, <clears throat> love yourself, I'm sorry, I got this wrong, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus didn't say, love your neighbor, then take care of yourself. He said, love your neighbor as you already love yourself. Jesus knew you have to love and take joy in your own life before you can ever bring joy and love to others. So I will assert that knowing how to enjoy your own life is a spiritual prerequisite for bringing joy and gladness to the world around you. Another way of saying this is joy begins at home and then spreads outward from that interior wellness to the world. Now, a lot of religions, particularly conservative ones, are very hesitant to affirm this truth. And that is that it's a good a spiritual thing for people to take joy and pleasure in their own lives. Some of you perhaps grew up in religious communities or religious families where joy and pleasure were basically seen in negative, selfish terms. Theologian Matthew Fox, who was once a Roman Catholic priest but was officially silenced by the Pope for a full year. And by the way, the day after his a year of silence, he got up before a crowd and he said, now, as I was saying when I was so rudely interrupted, <laughs> the theologically, he really got under the Pope's skin. Anyway, he uh, has long decried what he calls the one-sided, life-hating, fall redemption theology that is so focused on uh, conservative Christianity, on original sin, affirming instead what he calls a theology of original blessing. And he wrote a book on that. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon, Original Blessing by Matthew Fox. I'll let him say it in his own words. The scandal of conservative fall redemption theology is one of ignoring and then despising creation and those who love creation. Fall redemption theology has ignored the blessing that creation is because of its anthropomorphic preoccupation with sin. The result has been, among other things, the loss of pleasure from spirituality. And with, with this loss, the increase of pain, of injustice, of sadomasochism, and of distrust. And then he goes on. Creation-centered mystics, as well as in the Jewish tradition, have, on the other hand, always begun their theology with original blessing, not original sin. Knowing life is an original blessing is about enjoying life's basic gifts. And then he concludes by affirming we must learn spiritually how to take joy in our lives. If creation is a blessing and a constantly original one, then our proper response would be to enjoy it for God's sake. We human beings must learn the art of savoring. Pleasure is one of the deepest spiritual experiences of our lives. Ecstasy is the experience of God. In any case, with these ideas about the spiritual value of taking unstinting joy from life, our anathema to conservative religionists who frown on singing, dancing, sexuality, and almost anything else which feels good, they certainly strike, this original blessing idea strikes a spiritual chord with us Unitarian Universalists. Our positive life-affirming tradition has always first celebrated and affirmed what is right and lovely, beautiful, and joyful about this creation, and there is much of that. Ours is not obviously a guilt and sin-driven uh, religion, and so we easily and naturally embrace life-affirming theology, which celebrates the rightness of, of taking joy while you're here on earth and have the opportunity to do so. One of my favorite poems, which I have shared over these 11 years from time to time, is Welcome Morning by American poet Anne Sexton. The poem is all about having the spiritual and physical wisdom 
deep to the heart to know how to take immediate joy from everyday life and things. Welcome morning. There is joy in all, Sexton writes, in the hair I brush each morning, in the chapel of eggs I cook each morning, in the outcry from the kettle that heats my coffee each morning, in the spoon and the chair that cry, hello there, Anne, every morning, in the godhead of the table that I set my silver plate cup upon each morning. All this is God, right here in my pea green house each morning. And I mean, though often forget to give thanks, to faint down by the kitchen table in a prayer of rejoicing as the holy birds at the kitchen window peck into their marriage of seeds. So while I think of it, let me paint a thank you on my palm for this God, this laughter of the morning, lest it go unspoken. The joy that isn't shared, I've heard, dies young. The joy that isn't shared, I heard, dies young. Let me share one more coincidence about this name Joy. In that River Road Church, I had a parishioner named Joy Sexton, who was Anne Sexton's daughter. Let's just stop here for a moment, my dear Vero Beach friends, and take real spiritual and existential stock of our human situation. Here we all are together, unlikely voyagers on this remarkably spinning blue-green planet, mortal creatures all, with a lifespan to live of what? 70, 80, 90 years if we're lucky, maybe 100. Mortal creatures who find ourselves suddenly alive in a creation that is by almost any objective reckoning rich, holy, miraculous, generous, and beautiful. When you go outside today, just look around you for a second. What then, as the ancient Egyptians knew, could be of greater spiritual importance than knowing from the inside of our hearts out, uh, inside of our hearts out how to take joy, how to copiously and unstintingly take joy on a daily basis from the ordinary fabric of our lives. What could be more important than opening our eyes first in the morning and taking pleasure at what is quietly around us, the soft yellow sunlight faithfully working its gentle way through the bedroom blinds, that sweetly slumbering spouse, if you have one, who stuck with you, or that pet on the floor, or even worse, the pet in the bed, the birds outside and the palm trees singing their unrestrained odes to the returning dawn, the inviting smell of coffee you set your timer last night, wafting down the hallway from the kitchen, the promise of another day awaiting, work to do, chores to accomplish, meals to enjoy, kids and grandkids to play with, newspapers to digest, books to read, movies, to watch music, to listen to sleep, waiting to embrace us again in just a few hours. We imagine the gods have more, but they do not have access to any miracle greater than our children or grandchildren gleefully playing in the backyard, than a simple supper of spaghetti and good wine, cheap red, shared with old friends, then a sunset cast in red and orange billowing against the clouds on the horizon. They have no greater joy than crawling into crisp, clean sheets on a bed that will hold us safely until the next dawn. I have to tell you the truth, dear friends. All is spiritually lost. Life's great meaning is lost 
totally lost if we do not know how deep to our hearts to gratefully welcome these simple gifts of living, these holy treasures that are ours in ordinary days. The Egyptians didn't exactly say this, but I will, unless we somehow know how to take or find joy in all the little ways that make such a big difference, we are already in one way dead because we have squandered the great gift of ordinary life that has been bestowed upon us. Listen to African American, I'm sorry, American poet Jane Kenyon, who reminds us that this life is in fact a fleeting gift that we do not have forever. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood all morning. I did the work I love. At noon, I laid down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the wall and planned another day just like this day. But one day I know it will be otherwise. Just a few months after she wrote these words, she came down with a cancer that would quickly take Jane Kenyon's life. One day it will be otherwise. This is why, if we know the true meaning of life from the inside out, we must have the spiritual and emotional wisdom to seek and take joy and to do it frequently. Every day we find ourselves because we all know someday it will be otherwise. So take joy now, dear friends. Open your eyes and your ears and your heart to the original blessing of the life that is yours. You know, life is supposed to be fun. Do you, do you all remember that? Life is supposed to be fun. I had a minister say that once to me. There were three of us working at the River Road Unitarian Church, and we were going through a conflict. And she said, Scott, you know, church is supposed to be fun. Life is supposed to be fun. But as the ancient Egyptians wisely knew, just taking joy privately for yourself is, of course, a tragically incomplete spiritual and existential plan. If you are to find the full and finest and completest meaning of life, you must not forget, not even for a moment, of the other essential spiritual half of the Egyptian equation, that being to give joy to others. If you're going to successfully avoid those hungry hippos, you must give joy and create opportunities for pleasure for others. As I suggested earlier, even though it may seem counterintuitive at first, I believe the spiritual impetus to give joy to others is clearly rooted in your ability to first know how to take joy for yourself. Every joyful person I know, every last one of them, is naturally generous toward others. Joyful people who are truly grateful for what they have seem to work from what we call an abundance model as opposed to a finite, you know, a limited model. They believe that there's plenty of joy out there for themselves, and so their hearts reason that it's not going to cost them anything to give it to others. I believe joyful people have a kind of natural empathy that almost compels them to give, to be joy givers as much as they are joy takers. Philosopher and mathematician Alfred North Whitehead once wrote, the secret to happiness lies in knowing this, 
that we live by the law of expenditure. We find the greatest joy not in getting, but in expressing what we are. There are tides in the ocean of life, and what comes in depends on what goes out. The currents flow inward only when there is an outlet. Nature does not give to those who will not spend. Here, gifts are merely loaned to those who will not use them. Empty your lungs. Breathe, run, climb, work, and laugh. The more you give out, the more you shall receive. Be exhausted and you shall be fed. People do not really live for honors or for pay. Their gladness is not in taking and holding, but in the doing, the striving, the building, the living. It is a higher joy to teach than to be taught. It is good to get justice, but better to give it. Fun to have things, but more fun to make them for others. The happy person, Whitehead ends, is the one who lives the life of love and expenditure, not for the honors it may bring, but for the life itself. Does this all make sense to you? Conversely, someone who only selfishly seeks pleasure and joy for himself is ultimately what we call a miserable human being. I had an uncle like that. If you are some sort of inward turning hedonist, selfishly seeking satisfaction and joy only for yourself, then your entire life will eventually be poisoned by that isolating narcissism. I do not believe anyone can truly know joy in their heart of hearts if they are not regularly seeking to share and spread joy to others. And so if I'm right, sharing joy is really in our own spiritual self-interest. Forgiving and getting joy are inextricably bound up in one another, and doing one enhances the other and eventually blesses all. Let me give a simple everyday example. Uh, last week when I was out in Wisconsin visiting my extended family, Collins and I had time to play with Owen and Ethan, the five and a half year old twins of my nephew Ryan. When you play with kids, we had the attack of the woodpeckers on their heads. That was a big hit. Not only do you bring laughter to their faces, but you also bring joy to your own heart. This is the eternal truth. When it comes to joy, what gets around comes around. Well, my little pulpit clock, you didn't know I had this up here, did you? <laughs> Two minutes to 11, oh my God, I'm going to make it. Says that it's time for this sermon to come to an end. I hope I have persuaded all of you that the meaning of life, the meaning of life, capital T, is curiously and quietly found in the twin and interconnected, intertwined spiritual practices of both taking and giving joy. It is imperative in your everyday spiritual life that you work when it comes to joy and satisfaction from an abundance model. Know deep to your heart how to find and take joy from your daily life. Be unstinting even reckless in sucking from the marrow of your life all the joy that is waiting there for you to discover. And don't feel guilty about pleasure and enjoyment because that is what you were designed as a human being to do. Life is supposed to be fun. And from that wealth of ever more joyful being, be unstinting even reckless offering and opening joy to others, both strangers and friend. Let there be no doubt about it, dear friends. The hungry hippos are always, always, always out there with open joys, open jaws, waiting for you to forget life's holy work of taking and giving joy. So don't you dare forget life's holy work taking joy and giving it. <laughs>